Can you walk me through specifically as to where you're able to put price increases and where you're still seeing the hit from input costs? Uh, yes, so the, I'll start with the hit of the input cost. Uh, there's basically four areas where we see an effect at the moment. Uh, one is in those agricultural prices that uh, that Guy was talking about. We see that in wheat, and your pun, uh, and, and uh, we see that in cocoa for our chocolate business. So wheat for our biscuit business, cocoa for our chocolate business. We also see it in packaging materials. And we see it in uh, transportation. And then as it relates to our own conversion cost, cost of our plants and so on, obviously there's some extra COVID costs, which are okay for the time being, but that's an extra cost we're seeing. If, if you look at that package of, of inflation that we're having and you compare that to previous years, it's higher than it normally is. Every year we have to deal with this from different uh, sources sometimes, different ingredients, but it happens every year. This year it's higher, um, and it's different for every company how much higher it is and how you deal with it. So in, in our case, I would call it manageable. And so we, we think, yes, we clearly can see the effect, but we, it will not uh, result in a major shock for the consumer in our case. Now, how do we deal with that? Um, we, we try to... Um, make sure that uh, the pricing is not sort of a line pricing and your Oreo suddenly jumps from $3.99 to $4.99. It's, it's more um, uh, a very uh, uh, diverse effect called uh, revenue growth management, which is you play around with how many times do you promote, uh, what type of promotions do you run, uh, what do you do with the size of the packaging and things like, like that. So, it's, it's, a, it's a less obvious effect to the consumer, mm -hmm. and that's the way we are planning to deal with it. We've already done some of that. We've done some in North yep. America. We increased chocolate prices in Europe. Uh, we've, we've done uh, uh, Brazil, Mexico, some of it in, in Southeast Asia. So we, we've already implemented uh, a lot of it because we, we saw that coming uh, last year. And then the other thing we've done last year is, uh, as we saw it happening, we extended our coverage and we hedged uh, yep. and we're very disciplined in that approach. So uh, that's Good. a little bit the overview of what, do, of what we do. Greatly appreciated. Let's, let's figure out what that actually means in terms of the way that you're repositioning the business. Do you focus on areas? How do you determine where you're going to put your focus? If you are seeing one area where input costs are rising, do you focus on a different area? Does, does this input cost inflation that you're seeing kind of the, affect the emphasis you put on different products, SKUs? No, no, it, it, it doesn't. Uh, it might change the pricing that happens on different uh, products. But uh, in the end, we are trying to do what the consumer uh, wants. That's, that's critical to keep our business growing. So we, we don't try to steer in, in specific directions. Um, it, now, if the effect is extraordinary, we might have, have to do that. But in general, I would say we try to make sure that every single one of our brands is at, at the right price point where the consumer interest is high. And mm -hmm. the, the, the whole secret about this is, yes, prices have to increase, but do you do it in a way that the interest of the consumer remains there and your volumes continue? And can you keep on investing in your business uh, so that you can support your brands. It's, it's sort of that balance that we need to find. I'm talking about balance. You mentioned you're doing a strategic review of the gum business and that all options are on the table. Can you give us some perspective as to how much that category weighed down on your result in last quarter? Well, I, uh, for instance, to give you an idea, uh, our biscuit business in a two-year stack, because, because of COVID, we are trying now to compare uh, two-year uh, growth rates. So our CAGR yearly growth rate for the last two years in, in biscuit is 7.5%. For chocolate, it's 6.5%. For uh, gum, uh, particularly in developed markets, it's minus 16, minus 17%. Wow. So clearly very affected. It's only, gum is only 5% of our business, and we're talking particularly about gum in developed markets, which is only 2% of our business. But okay. gum, consumption of gum before uh, COVID was already not a very vibrant category. So you have to ask yourselves, okay, where are we going? And are we paying sufficient attention to something that's 2% of our business? Out of curiosity, Dirk, why are people not 
chewing as much gum as they used to? Um, many reasons. Um, the, the two or three big ones, I would say, is gum is, is diversion. It, it, it makes you relax. It, it sort of takes away stress. That is still there. The other one that gum does is, is breath refreshing, um, a refreshing feeling in your mouth. That is still there. But they find mint, mint sorry, uh, much more socially acceptable than, than seeing the chewing. I think uh, cell phones have uh, given also another way of relaxing and go, go on, on social media and yeah. the same thing as chewing gum. Uh, the decline of smoking, a lot of people to have mm. fresh bread uh, yeah, I was about linked that. to smoking. So th those, are, those are the main reasons that you see. And I think the main thing is that uh, millennials and Generation Z have shown less interest. Now yeah. we see with the crisis, that the idea that chewing gum makes you feel a little bit better if you feel tense and hyper-stressed, most people buy into that. So we mm -hmm. are trying to explain to people that that's a way that uh, gum can play a role in your way, in your life. Um, last question for you, Dirk. Monterey International is enormous. How are you looking at bringing people back into the office? Well, we've, we've always been flexible in our approach. I think if, as long as people get the job done, let them do it in the way that fits their personal life best. And, and that's one of our selling propositions as a company. So when, when the crisis came, it was not such a big deal for us, to be honest. But nobody is in the offices at the moment. And we do feel that there's a number of reasons, the culture, the, the, the talk that happens, not in official meetings, but in the corridors, uh, the camaraderie, go and have a drink after work and things like that. You miss all that. So we do feel that they need to come back. Um, what we're thinking about is to, and we also want people to get vaccinated. So we want to give an incentive yep. to, to people that get vaccinated. They can come back to the office for the time being. Uh, we will start that in July as a voluntary approach. And then uh, in September, uh, more of an expectation. And then we'll see what happens with the people that don't get vaccinated. But yep. at the moment, we want to create an environment where you feel comfortable. And it's like it used to be in the office. And, and we can only do if everybody's vaccinated. We can only we, do that if everybody's vaccinated, basically. 